I run an organization called the International Rescue Committee, which was uh, created by Albert Einstein in 1933 when he came to New York and fled from uh, Nazi Germany. Um, we've uh, evolved over the years to be an organization that still resettles refugees into the United States. About 10,000 refugees a year we resettle into the U.S. But our 12,000 staff are mainly focused around the world in battling the worst humanitarian crises uh, that are uh, raging. And we are mainly focused on the conflict end rather than the natural disaster end of the humanitarian spectrum. That means that we tend to have to stay for a long time because a lot of the conflicts that we're dealing with are, are long term. And I thought it would be interesting, just to really looking forward, uh, I said to Nigel I thought it would be much better to try and have this as a conversation rather than as a, a lecture, um, just, just to, sp to speak about three things uh, really. I'm sure you've heard from Jamila and others about the fact that this has been a record-breaking year for crisis and disaster. I mean, this is a growth industry, the humanitarian sector, for all the wrong reasons. Last year, 52 million people were displaced from their homes by conflict and disaster, one every four seconds, as Antonio Guterres likes to uh, point out. So I don't want to go back over uh, that litany of statistics. I, I thought I would just do three things. One, ask the question, why is this happening? What, what, why are there record numbers of people being displaced by conflict and disaster? And I'll draw on some of my uh, previous life as a foreign minister in the UK and someone who's engaged in international foreign policy. Secondly, I want to talk not about the challenges, but the changes that are going on in the humanitarian sector. Because it seems to me that as well as the humanitarian sector getting bigger, it's also a changing sector. And I think that that's maybe one of the motivations behind the World Humanitarian Summit, that we're very lucky to have Jamila uh, choreographing. And then thirdly, talk a bit about some of the, the solutions orientation, where are some of the solutions going to come from? Because uh, I'm concerned that our sector, which obviously is addressing suffering, is, is inducing a lot of fatigue by talking all about suffering rather than talking about solutions. And I think this is a solutions-oriented uh, group of people. So look, why, why are their record numbers of people being displaced by conflict and disaster? I, I think fundamentally there are two reasons that are important for us to understand. One is that a growing number of states, 30, 40, are finding it increasingly difficult to contain ethnic and political and religious difference within political, peaceful political boundaries. And many of those same states are finding it impossible to meet the basic needs of their citizens. So you've got this fundamental issue of state and civil society capacity, and to some extent private sector capacity, in a growing number of states. Now, it's important to understand what I'm not saying as well as what I am saying. President Obama said three weeks ago, if you switch on the news, you'd think the world is going to hell. And it's obviously not the case that the world, a single planet, is going uh, to hell in such a... Uh, it's not the right thing to say. The world's never been richer. It's also the case that, the, uh, and this may seem counterintuitive, the world has never been more peaceful. There are fewer wars between states than for at least 300 years. But what's happening in this, relative, in this minority of states, let's say 30 states, uh, out of 190 in the world, is that the inability to meet basic needs combined with the inability to keep difference within peaceful boundaries is causing ructions beyond those states as well. And I think that's the first factor that's going on. In a way, it's a facet of globalization. It's important to see that. The, the assertion of identity, be it ethnic, religious, or political identity, and the determination to carry that beyond peaceful politics is, in a way, a facet of globalization. It's a part of the empowerment that, no doubt, this conference and others like it have talked about a lot. And the second feature, and I hope I don't tread on any distinguished toes in saying this, the international system is too weak and divided to make up for the difficulties that states are having in maintaining order in meeting basic services. And you can decide whether you want to say the weakness and division of the international system or the division and the weakness of the international system. What order you put them in can suggest a degree of causality um, a line of causation, but that is the second feature of this sometimes called a leaderless world, uh, a world in which power has um, 
been has has leaked, the power has 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 moved from big institutions to um, millions of individuals who are billions of individuals actually who are connected in ways as never before. So I just think it's important to have that frame in mind. Uh, second point: How is the sector changing? I think this is really important. I've learned a lot about this in the last year. I've been president of the IRC for just a year now. Um, we are a sector, the humanitarian sector, which is increasingly urban. The iconic image of a refugee, and IRC was founded as a refugee agency, is obviously people who live in refugee camps. But the minority of people who are of the 52 million people who are displaced by conflict and disaster are living in refugee camps. In Lebanon, an, our unofficial estimate is that there are 1.5 to 1.7 million refugees from the Syria crisis. There isn't a single refugee camp being built for them in uh, Lebanon. In Jordan, there are 87,000 people in the Za'atri refugee camp. It's the third largest city in Jordan. It, it, uh, is, uh, it's the only, it, well, there's 14,000 in the second camp, but essentially a million people are not in refugee camps. So the, the first way in which the sector is changing is that it's urbanizing. Uh, the second uh, way in which it's uh, changing, and I think this is, if not equally uh, significant, it, it, it's important. The humanitarian sector is changing because those who those people who are suffering from human, the impact of conflict and disaster are suffering for longer. One reason the numbers are going up is that the civil wars that are a feature, I said that interstate wars were at a record low, the number of civil wars is high, not just, there are more of them that are lasting longer. And essentially the Syria crisis is being piled on, the Somalia crisis is being piled on, the Afghan crisis. So you've got longer lasting civil wars. And the duration of displacement is a significant factor that's changing things. And a third um, factor that I think is important that I alluded to earlier is that the humanitarian disasters that we are seeing are becoming regional and sub-regional, not just national. So the Syria crisis is actually a Middle East crisis. The Somalia crisis is an East Africa crisis. South Sudan, where IRC has been for 25 years, 450,000 refugees have gone into Ethiopia, Uganda, and Kenya. So you've got sub-regional crisis as well. And I think that if we're going to start thinking about solutions, which is the third thing I wanted to talk about, we have to think about those three elements of change that are going on in the, um, in the humanitarian space. And just to, to finish up, let me say a word about the third aspect of this, which is how do we move beyond um, talking about suffering to actually addressing solutions. I think there are three things that are really important. One is that obviously the whole service model that in many ways is based on the idea that people are, to some extent, captive in refugee camps, the whole model has to change fundamentally. And so your theme of empowering individuals, of engaging individuals, is absolutely key uh, if we're talking about people who are in urban areas, not in, um, not in uh, refugee camps. And there are high policy aspects of this, but there are also rhetorical aspects of it. We've just finished our strategic refresh process. And one of the things we're changing, we're going to stop talking uh, about saving lives, which our current mission statement does. And we're going to start talking about survival. And the difference is that if you're saving lives, I will save your life. And beneficent me will come and save you. Whereas if you talk about survival, you recognize the fact that this has got to be a process that engages both the skills and the wealth of, of those who are coming from outside, but also the passion and the uh, capacity and the agency of those who are on the receiving end of humanitarian disaster. So uh, point one it would be crazy to fight the age of empowerment. We've got to ride it. We've got to surface. We've got to engage it. And I think that's an important uh, principle. Uh, the second is perhaps surprising coming from an NGO. But um, I'm really convinced, if you take this idea that people are displaced for longer, the average refugee, not displaced person, but the average refugee, according to UN figures, is out of their own home, for 20, out of their own home country for 20 years. And that figure does not include the Palestinians. So it's a, it's a very long duration. You cannot have a sustainable program of help for those people that is purely a social program. It's got to be an economic program as well as a social uh, program. And that immediately challenges our sector to think in very different ways about what it does and how it does it. Just a small example, um, our whole history, and it's an honorable history in many ways, is about giving people food, giving people shelter, giving people winterization kits. Last winter in Lebanon, um, 90,000 people, both uh, refugees and host communities, because they weren't in refugee camps, were given $100 a month cash 
voucher equivalent. And so instead of being given them a service to help them survive the winter, they were given the cash and the opportunity to decide for themselves what they wanted to spend it on. And what we did, the IRC has just done the research study on this. What we found is a number of things. First of all, the money wasn't, was spent in a very responsible way. But it wasn't all spent on the items that we would have chosen. Some of it went on fuel, which probably wouldn't have been part of the $100 package that was given to people. Some of it went on food. Um, some of it went on uh, the kind of winterization um, uh, components that you might think of. We also found that for every dollar we gave, $2.16 uh, revolved around the local economy. So there was a local economic uh, boost uh, as well. And I just want to make this point. To talk about economics alongside social policy sounds sensible until you realize that these are people, when they've crossed from one country into another, who are not entitled to work. So the politics of addressing the economics of the situation of refugees is, a, is very, very uh, live. Even, I mean, it's a different situation for internally displaced people of the 52 million, that two to one are internally displaced rather than, uh, rather than um, uh, crossing borders, but I still, think it's, uh, I still think it's very, very significant. Now, uh, let me just finish up with the following uh, point. Your world, if I understand it rightly, is absolutely key if we're to start getting ahead of some of these issues. And it pains me that the South Sudan crisis was a surprise when it happened to everyone. It was a surprise, but in fact it's engulfed 15% of the population there. Um, the refugees that we are meeting out in Syria, outside in, in Jordan, Turkey, Lebanon, and Iraq, 2.7 times is the average displacement they've already had before they've made it into a neighboring country. But there isn't good mapping yet of the people movements that are happening within Syria. Why? Significantly because of security concerns. So I'm interested in what's the extent to which we can help people map their own movement without compromising their security. Because I know of cases where people's mobile phones, people have been stopped inside Syria at government checkpoints. Is this an on the record session or an off the record session, Nigel? Okay, so I'll be careful what I say then. We, we have to be very, very careful about what information we expect people to send about who they know and what they um, uh, and where they've uh, and where they've uh, been. But uh, the 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 idea that we can neglect the identification, including the self-identification of need prior to addressing it seems to me to be uh, very, very uh, dangerous indeed. And I think that that just leads to a final point that I, I don't know the answer to yet, but which I think is really, really important. If you think about the public services that governments and NGOs deliver in advanced industrialized countries, the revolution that's happened in the last 20 years has been to think about how accountability needs to flow, not just to meet government targets, but how the accountability has to flow to meet the needs of beneficiaries. Now, the world that I've moved into, this humanitarian sector, all of the accountability flows upwards to the donor, not downwards to the beneficiary. And one of the things that I think is standing in the way of cooperation between the humanitarian sector and the world that you inhabit is that that accountability relationship almost keeps out the kind of innovation and expertise that you've got. And so I think there's a challenge for us in the humanitarian sector to think, how do we get the freedom to be accountable to those in need, not just accountable to those who are paying the bills? In, in, in the ideal world, it should be to both. And I think if we can do that, we'll open up to the kind of um, pioneering breakthroughs that um, some of you who have already, some of you who have already made, but which, frankly, are still at the relative infancy in their impact on our world. And I, if we can spend the next 20 or 30 minutes discussing that, then I think it will be time well spent. Thank you very much indeed.